Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Renwick Gallery. Thank you so much for braving the incident outside to get here, and that's part of why we're delayed, to make sure everyone had a chance to get in. Um, I'm Gloria Kenyon. I'm the Public Programs Coordinator here for the Renwick Gallery. And I would just, before I introduce Patrick, would like to remind you to please silence your cell phones and no photography during the talk. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome my fellow North Carolinian, Patrick Doherty, this evening. Um, he is known for his stick work and branch work um, throughout the country, also around the world and downstairs. We were really delighted to have Shindig, and I hope each of you got the chance to explore it before you came up here. He's going to talk about his process and his work, and he's a delightful speaker, so you are all in for a treat. Welcome, Patrick. Can you hear it now? The magic of my pocket. <laughs> well, thank you all for, for having me. I really appreciate being here. This has been a great show, and its popularity has spread throughout the nation. There are so many people come here from other places that I've been traveling constantly since November when we installed, and I hear time and time again, I've just been to the Renwick. So it's been great. I'd like to make a few comments about my work and then show you some images. You know, my son Sam, he just graduated from college, but when he was a kid, he had a children's book about three bears that encounter urban sprawl. Well, these little bears, they go up over a hill near their house one morning, they look down, and somebody's built a shopping center overnight. Well, already people are hustling and bustling up and down the sidewalk, and they all look so satisfied. Well, little bears, they're not sure they're happy anymore, and somewhere they find people clothes, and the next sequence of pictures you see these little pint-sized figures moving amongst the legs of all the other passers-by, and the caption reads, well, now that they're like everybody else, are they really happy? Well, no, not really, because underneath their people clothes still beat this furry little animal heart. Well, a big wind comes up, it blows and it blows, men's ties up, women's skirts out, one big gust blows all the little bear's clothes off, and for the first time, they really see each other, and they recognize who and what they are, they go tearing back across the parking lot, back to a place they could just be themselves. Well, it wasn't so many years ago as the, as the crow flies that I was getting ready for work. I had a coat and tie on, a briefcase. I start down my walkway, a really big wind comes up. And it blows and it blows. The first gust blows my briefcase right down the street. The second blows off my coat and tie. The third blows everything else away. As I'm standing there, completely amazed at this unlikely turbulence in my life, the only thing I could feel under my people clothes is this kind of thudding of an animal heart. And I had flashbacks to all the times in my life that all I could think about was giving up my normal life, going off into the distance, maybe into the wilderness, and building a small cabin and living in a more essential way. Well, you know, it was a, a time of change for me. And I found myself at the how-to section of the library. I saw things like load-bearing, R-factor, and coefficient, and I said, you know, maybe building a house, even a small cabin, is a whole lot harder than I thought. But luckily for me, as I start back across the library, I happened to stumble on a stack of National Geographics. And maybe the first was an article about the barrios in Rio de Janeiro, in which a whole group of the population, the disenfranchised, had to go out into the highways and byways and pick up the dendritus, the cast-offs of urban life, and take that material somewhere and build them a place to live. So I know I'm not supposed to like this because these are really poor people, and yet they've done an amazing job with the material that they had at hand. Or maybe it was an article about a tribe in the Amazon basin who had to go into the jungle and gather up whatever was available to build a, a place to live. I said, I know these things don't have any running water or electricity, but they're beautiful and they fit so well back into the environment from which the material was drawn. Or maybe it was an article about a bird from Africa that had done an amazing engineering feat. I said, I know these birds are not smart enough to do this, but in human terms, this would be considered amazing craftsmanship. As then I realized that maybe I wasn't a normal builder. Maybe I was more of a hunter and gatherer, 
some kind of an inspiration builder. And you know, I did get started on that house, and I learned some things while building it that have really stood me in good stead in my art life. Maybe the first is really the simplest. It's learning to accept your progress, or learning to accept what you do. You know, if you don't know much about building, you put a window in in the morning, you look at it all day by the afternoon, you're thoroughly disgusted with yourself. You're running to jerk that thing right out. So to be fair to myself, I decided that even before I began, that I was going to do the very best job I could do. At the end of the day, I was going to accept my progress, and the next day I would build on it. The second thing is if you use non-standard materials, like so many sculptors do, you can't always go to Lowe's or Home Depot and buy the things you need. And similarly, if you cut a big tree down and use it as the mainstay of your house, how do you know it would work, and who would you ask? Well, I played a game with myself. I called giving it my one best shot. And I said, wait, if I'm the last person on Earth and there's nobody else to ask, what do I think? Do I think it's strong enough? And somewhere along there, I began accepting responsibility for the kinds of things that I designed and made. The third thing is that working day in and day out in a very unselfconscious way, I began to see what I liked and what I didn't. I saw how important personal preference is in making those decisions. And over a period of time, I began to develop my own sense of personal aesthetic. And finally, I saw how important need was in getting anything done. I really needed this house. So I was able to coalesce my best energies and direct my best problem-solving skills. And sometimes when I have a sculptor friend who's not doing that well with their work, I'll say, hey, you have to figure out how to need it. Well, I didn't know it was getting out of hand, but my neighbors did. They were always coming down and scratching their head and kicking the dirt. And once my friend Brooks brought a relative from another area of the country, he said, you know, I like what you're doing here. You're a real artist. Well, maybe for all of you, that would be a great thing for somebody to say to you. But for me, it felt like the edge of the earth. I really wanted him to take it back. Upon reflection, I realized that as a child, I thought being an artist was the greatest thing you could be. The only trouble was it seemed to come with this tremendous sense of social responsibility. You were supposed to do something great, something earth-shaking, something that saved people. And it was, had that corresponding word talent. Somehow you were supposed to be talented. Well, I could figure out what the had, word talent and art had to do with Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo. I just couldn't figure out what it had to do with me or anything I, I was doing at my house. Well, one morning, if it, as if by magic, I found myself enrolling at the nearest art department, taking art history and sculpture courses. And you know, for me, that minute, that day, was the best day of my life. Because I didn't know there was anybody else like me. I didn't know there were lots of people that liked handling materials, like seeing their ideas get worked out in three dimension. The only trouble was I was kind of an art nerd, and I'd walk around and I'd say, is this art? Is this art? How come this person gets to paint this board blue and call it art? And it wasn't long before one of the professors grabs me by the throat and starts choking me to death. He said, who in the hell cares if it's art or not? Why don't you just go in there and make whatever you're going to make? Who's going to know the difference in 20 years anyway? You know, I needed that permission giving. And I learned some things while I was in school that I think helped in, you know, me become a working artist. And maybe the first is the importance of a role model, because I didn't know if you had, a, had to have a psychiatrist standing by when you made your first piece, or whether you had to have family upheaval, or go to New York and work as a waiter in order to qualify. And it wasn't until I saw these relatively normal people who were intensely interesting and interested in making that I realized there was going to be some hope for me. The second thing is it's hard to be a food faddist unless there are other people around who eat beans and rice. And similarly, it's hard to be a working artist unless there are other people around who understand what you're going through. And I think the single biggest uh, hurdle for me as a working artist is to maintain a sense of personal equilibrium. This in a society that gives high marks to culture, but really ignores individual makers. And it's easy to have an ad identity crisis at any time in your career in which you, for one minute, you walk in your studio and you don't recognize who made the work. It's then that you're glad that there's a university art department around or you have a friend in a distant location 
you call them up and you say, hey, Scott, are you still working? And when you find out they are, somehow you're able to be released and go back to work. The third thing is that I began to see that there was a big difference between doers and viewers, between people who make work and who look at work seriously. To me, it looked like two different jobs. Museum directors, curators, gallery owners, you know, their job is to decide what object is more inherently interesting than another or where something fits in the lifeline of art. You know, that's not my job. I have to be true to my materials, true to my ideas. Sometimes when I begin working, I don't really know what I'm doing. If at that point I had to decide whether something was art historically significant or if it was good, I would never get going. And finally, I had to figure out about that word talent. And I decided, although talent wasn't irrelevant, it just wasn't the issue. I had the right to make what I wanted, however much I wanted. Basically, I could do as much work as I could afford. Well, at some shimmering moment, I decided to quit school, go home, build a studio, and get to work. Well, it's one thing you, to know that you have the right to make something. It's another thing to know what you're going to make and how you're going to make it. And luckily for me, I kept up with the university. I went to a lecture by a woman named Marty Zelt who had been a seamstress in her life before sculpture. And she brought Velcro fasteners, zippers, and cloth to her work. So as I'm driving home from that lecture, I'm saying, I wonder what I already know. I wonder what simple technology or some simple method of joining that I might already be familiar with. And as I'm passing down the road, I'm saying, all these saplings that maintenance crews are constantly striving in North Carolina to keep down and like Saul being struck off his horse on the way to Damascus, I had an epiphysis. I said, hey, maybe I could use those. Well, it wasn't so unusual that a woodsman like myself would see the potential of the saplings along his driveway. They're plentiful, they're renewable. It's just like having a giant warehouse always at your fingertips. After working with this material for a while, I realized that I had a deeper resonance with it. I had grown up in the woodlands of North Carolina. We have lots of underbrush, lots of intersecting lines. And as some kids laid in fields and looked at the architectural details of clouds, I found myself looking at the drawing quality of the winter landscape, all those hatch marks, all those lines in the distance. So when I turned to sculpture, it seemed easy to co-opt the forces of nature and play this natural drawing style out onto the surfaces of these large gestural works. Before I could get going, I had to figure out what birds and beavers and other natural shelter builders know about sticks, and that is that they have an inherent method of joining. If you drag a stick through the woods, you see what I mean? You start like this, and before you realize it, it's got this infuriating tendency to tangle with everything around it. That's really the simplest method of joining. And every stick has a little bit of flexibility, so if you flex it and pull it through a matrix and let it go, it, it kind of snaps back and holds itself in place. That's the how, but the what. If you had seen me at that moment, you would have taken pity on me, because I could only spend about one minute in a museum before running down the steps with sweaty palms and saying, hey, I think they used all the good ideas up. Or maybe you'd read an art magazine and you'd see, you know, Ceramics Monthly, and say, well, they've exploited every material. And then you find out in the last census alone, over a million people in New York City claimed to be visual artists. You'd say, whoa, there's too many of us. But after worrying about this for a while, I realized that I love to make things, and the art world was just going to have to lump it. Before I show you some images, I just say two other things, one about the art world and the other about creativity. You know, for me, the art world is not a wall. What it is is a loosely knit group of jobs, and those jobs are filled with people, good people, like you and I. They don't tell artists what they have to do. Artists have to decide what they want to do, and there's not one of us that hasn't imagined being taken to a major city in a fiery chariot where uh, our work and, uh, gets what it deserves. The only trouble is we all want different things. We want a different kind of car, a different kind of family life, to live in a certain place. And it's all these real world decisions that help set the priorities of what opportunities we allow ourselves to be available to. The second thing is, you know, I always arrive, arrive with a pair of clippers and three weeks later I have to have a good piece. So I've had a, two reflections about creativity. One is that hysteria rides on the shoulder 
of every creative person. And so if you want to go somewhere and get going immediately, you have to be able to control your hysterical energy and direct it. The second thing is that I have different states of being. I have a state of being in which I do my laundry and eat my dinner, and another state, a door behind which all my problem-solving skills lay. And this question is, how do you go over and open that door immediately? If, you'd, if I happened to be home on Friday and my neighbors would get together, you know, we would, you would see the cares of the week falling away and everybody is laughing and think, I wonder why we're not on some kind of national talk show or something. But what I say is the best state of making is one in which a person is very unselfconscious but fully themselves. And that's the state of making that I seek. It's not about wringing your hands or being, you know, in trouble all the time. It's, it, for me, it's more like just being with your friends. So uh, I would say one other thing. There, one of the unique things about my work is that there's no studio doors to close and no place to hide. The work is done in full public view and the public has access to the process. From some artists, that would be kind of consternating, but for me, it's turned out to be a cultural exchange, one in which the energy of that place and those people are folded back into the work itself. You know, when I'm on site, I like representing making in a positive way. I like interceding for the arts. I like demystifying the process. But mainly, I like reminding people that artists are just normal people who are looking for their rightful place in the world of work. So I'd like to show you a few images and talk to you a little bit about my work. This is my house in North Carolina. I live in Chapel Hill. I just included uh, a few uh, pictures of this so that you could see. This is all uh, material that's just been collected around the place. I dug these stones out of the back of the yard. I know that they're not quite as good at the bottom as they are the top. Uh, I've learned to sequence things like I do in my work. Oftentimes if we have one set of bad sticks and some good sticks, we put the bad sticks on the inside. So if you build a stone wall, you take and put all the good ones on the outside and all the bad ones on the end. Uh, I've used um, uh, things that I've gathered from my woods, uh, cedar, split it out and used it for my ceilings throughout the house. Uh, you know, I, in the process of building, we took down the sticks in the yard and uh, built all kinds of sheds and my neighbors have been the recipients of, of many stick sheds as well. Um, this, I, you know, I didn't know if anybody would build a monument to me, so I just went ahead and built one to myself. <laughs> and this is just a laid up stone uh, situation. It's a, a bit about uh, painting in some ways. I picked the stones up between uh, my house and uh, uh, driving downtown. Uh, you know, my neighbors are always saying that when their uh, children go to college, that their life is going to change. And this is called Waiting It Out in Maple. And, uh, I put these out the front of my property so they could see themselves. I've got a lot of neighbors, and uh, so there you go. It's called Waiting It Out of Maple. Uh, I wanted to show you a bit about my materials, because when you see these pieces, you imagine these super long lines of sticks, but what it is, most of the sticks are, are pretty short, the same thing as the piece downstairs, and uh, it's, it's your eye that hooks them all together. Uh, this is my friend Scott. We're bringing materials into a gallery. It's always uh, kind of an addition-subtraction problem. You're taking away and it's adding to the other thing, kind of like Rumpelstiltskin. Uh, this was at, uh, in, in Cincinnati at the uh, Heron School of Art. I'm always looking for material and finding places that uh, the bulldozer is just about to arrive. In this case, they were about to build a, a uh, expansion of their golf course for the city and we were able to go get the material. Uh, in, in Wyoming, you know, we're using willow. Uh, somebody had the idea that if they took a bulldozer and tried to clean their willow out of their lake, there would be less willow, but in fact there was only more willow and so I was the lucky recipient. Uh, on the uh, edges of a volcano and uh, in Maui, we were gathering this material. It's uh, strawberry guava and, uh, and eucalyptus. And in Ireland, uh, a willow farm that we gathered from that was a biomass farm with the idea that they would grow willow on uh, imperfect ground and they'd get a crop every year and the power company would use it. However, 
the farmers were there, the power company is not there, so we, there was a lot of willow around uh, for my taking. Uh, this is a piece in, in, uh, in Richmond, Virginia. I just wanted to show you this because a lot of times we'll get material with leaves on it and we have to go through the laborious process of taking them off. This was the piece that we made from, let's see if this is gonna work. This is the piece we made from it. It's called uh, Diamonds in the Rough. There are these 11 diamond kind of cabanas. Uh oh, it's wild now. Uh, I wanted to show you a piece from start to finish. This is a, a willow farm in Ireland, and you know, prior to uh, contemporary times, uh, they raised willow and used it for every conceivable thing. The walls of your house, baskets, uh, coracles, uh, many, many different uses. Uh, we always have the problem of getting the material over to the site. In this case, the city sent us a truck. These are our big structural pieces that they're holding at the top there. This is Tala Community Art Center, and you know Ireland has not only leprechauns, it's got a lot of crime, and they were uh, concerned that I not work outside this fence. I was concerned that the local people be able to see at least what I was doing. And so I've used this, uh, uh, this tree as the basics of the piece. Uh, this is my scaffolding. In this area of, of uh, Dublin, there's a, a lot of Irish round towers. It was a kind of a manifestation of these monks from the 8th to the 10th century, built these enigmatic towers. And so I, I was trying to use this vernacular architecture uh, to gain favor with the people nearby. Uh, this is the, a finished tower. All of the living limbs of this tree are on the exterior of the piece. And so this is the way it looked uh, two years later, just before the piece came down. Um, I'll show you another uh, piece uh, from start to finish. This is at Cornell. This is a good stand of sticks for building a sculpture. We had the, had the opportunity of taking them over to our site. Uh, this was a, a plaza between one of the dormitories and the Performing Arts Center. My uh, idea was to build a companion piece for each one of these locust trees. There are seven trees, so it was going to be, you know, seven uh, cabanas or pieces that fit around the trees in different ways. Um, I always make a kind of a thumbnail sketch. It's a, a read into sketch. It's not an exact um, idea. And so I make something about that each time. Uh, as we did down below here in the gallery, we took uh, we have to lay out the uh, footprint of the piece. In the case, in the gallery below, we had lots of extension cords and we were putting them out and kicking them around so we could figure out what the space would be. And um, in this case, they were going to allow me to drill into this plaza because they were going to replace it in some way or the other. So I drilled these holes, I put my structural pieces down in the holes, and then I attached the, the tops of them, I build the piece kind of the sketch out the piece by tying it to the scaffolding and then when I've, uh, I've got it firmed up and I can cut it loose. And this is a, sometimes we have more elaborate scaffolding. The one down in the gallery below was not so elaborate because we didn't have to work so high. And this was the final piece at the, um, at the opening. Um, darn it. I wanted to show you how I worked. This is a piece at Savannah College of Art and Design. This was a county jail uh, prior to being turned over to the college. So uh, my idea was to build lots of escape hatches or maybe a magic carpet to get out of jail. Uh, but I work structurally first. In this case, I'm going to weave into these jail bars. I'm using that platform lift. I'm traveling along there. It's, built, it's a bit like building a canvas and then drawing on it. So the canvas part is the structural part that lays behind it. And then the next part is the aesthetics. So it's kind of a layering process that once you get a good strong structure, you can add sticks at will on the surface, like I'm building these circularities and, and giving the aesthetic value to the piece. And then finally, the cosmetics. You know, you go back and basically erase things you don't like. If you see inconsistencies that are bugging you in the surface, you can take tiny sticks and just reduce the value of, uh, of what you're seeing. So, and then you can go back and kind of reassert. Uh, when you have big walk-in pieces like the piece below, it's always about getting the sticks out of people's eyes, about cleaning up the surfaces so it's usable and uh, by your, you know, 
kid that's jumping in and out of the window or riding their bike through or whatever. Um, I want to talk about my work in terms of temporary because I do temporary work. This is a pink and white dogwood. I've bent it down over several days. Uh, you can see that it's starting to flower on the surface. Uh, I knew I had about three months from an arborist before it hurt the tree, so it ended up leafing out on the surface of the piece, and then finally it had to be taken down. The slide that's missing is uh, dragging this piece behind a car to the city dump. But, so anyway, my work is temporary. It, it comes down at a point. Uh, this was at Swarthmore College. Luckily for me, I had a strong vertical on one side, all the limbs on the other. It allowed me to build this stacking piece, uh, and it's called Abracadabra. It's about 55 feet tall, so sometimes we take our life in our hands to build something. Uh, but this is its winter configuration. And then finally, um, the takedown. The tree was going to come down. They knew that at two-year point, so they took the tree down and, and these uh, kind of dramatic takedown photos. Uh, a piece in Denmark in, uh, in a park called Krakamaken in which you were, had to gather your materials uh, within the park itself. Uh, this is what I characterize as a little big man who seeks his own reflection when he thinks about nature. And, uh, sorry, uh, you can go inside him and, uh, and get up and look out its face. Or during the winter time, they had a, uh, a flood every winter and it gave this more mythic look to the piece. And then finally, this is a hero that's fallen uh, on about the two year mark. Uh, a piece in, in, in uh, Michigan, and uh, you know, a lot of the, uh, all cultures have made face jugs. And so the Romans made them, the North Carolina potters made them, and this is my version, a 22 feet tall face jug called Juggernaut. And it looks, uh, you walk down a glass hallway and then you look out and this, the sculpture looks back at you. But anyway, at the two year mark, uh, they had a terrible snow and it came tearing down the roof and left these poor things screaming in the snow. And finally, uh, a piece in, um, in South Carolina uh, after Bramante's Tempietto called uh, Sitting Pretty. And uh, we planted living material within the walls uh, during its construction. So this was at its five year mark. And then again, about seven years. And now there's just a big grove of trees where this piece once set. Um, you know, I'd like to talk about my work in terms of drawing, because everything you can do with a pencil, you do with a stick. In other words, once these things come out of the woods with the overtones of nature, they become sticks with which to draw. And so when you hit a piece of paper with a pencil, you hit it with one weight and finish off with another. Basically, you make series of tapered lines. Since sticks are tapered, if you employ them in the right way, and organize the sticks, the tapers in one direction, you get a sense of implied motion, which luckily for me has a sense of what nature is about, or at least we think nature is about momentum. So I get some added benefit. This is a piece at the North Carolina Museum in Raleigh. It's about the most permanent piece. It's been up for three or four years. It still looks good. So interiorly, baskets could last forever. But generally, my work is up for the life of a show, just like it, here, it is here at Renwick. Here we're, we're uh, organizing our lines into uh, what we think are good surfaces. Uh, this is a piece at the Kohler Art Center in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. These pieces are woven into the, the uh, structure of the building above the light tracks. You can just go over and barely touch them. But what I like about this it's, it shows the delicate nature of the drawn line. It's using uh, a rosaria red twig dogwood and willow. And so, you know, just, it's just, just uh, you can see how delicate and how much information you can put into the drawn line. Excuse me. Um, this is a kind of sky writing. It's uh, another kind of drawing. This is uh, in the trees along the North Sea in Denmark. Uh, we just went across the road, gathered the material, brought it over, and sprung it into these trees. Darn it. This is uh, uh, in the World Trade Center, at a kind of big city calligraphy, another kind of drawing. Uh, if you work for the Port Authority, you know, they'll say, uh, we don't mind the sticks in the building as long as you don't touch the walls, the floors, or the ceilings. 
So I saw these electricians working on ladders and I thought, well, I'll just go to Putnam Ladder Company, borrow some ladders and just build this piece. So that, that's exactly what happened. And this is at the Phillips Collection uh, over here in, in Washington, and that's about three floors of sticks. That's about 16 feet across the interior of that. So this is a kind of using the smaller sticks and contrasting it with the kind of architectural drawn line uh, of the architecture itself. And uh, oftentimes I'm working with the um, activity of the building. In this case, we just put a spotter on the staircase and I worked on a platform lift and was able to complete this piece. This is um, at the uh, American Craft Museum at its old location in New York City, and there again, capitalizing on the, uh, the lines of the architecture and contrasting those with the smaller sticks. You know, I always use uh, volunteers in my work. Uh, it turns out that I learned to partner with organizations early on and use the goodwill and their leverage in the community to get what I needed. Initially, they would say, well, why should we hire people to help you gather? We've got lots of volunteers. And so that proceeded for a while. And then I realized there was a lot of closet stick gatherers out there, and they weren't just satisfied with gathering. They wanted to help build it. So over a period of time, I've, I've learned a lot about using volunteers. And uh, oftentimes, uh, the public will say, well, how do they know what to do? And I'll say, well, we've all been children, and for children, you know, a stick is an imaginative object. You know, it's a, a tool, a weapon, a piece of a wall. And, uh, you know, children play out the shadow life of our hunting and gathering past. And, and so uh, adults remember that. All you have to do is give them a stick and a point in the right direction, and everybody is feverishly working. Uh, this piece, you can see that I had too many bottles of Bordeaux in this in this uh, place, uh, region of France, and there are all these restaurants around. People sit around drinking wine for lunch and, and uh, looking at these fantasy bottles. And uh, it's glamour shot there in the... Oh, uh, this is a piece at, at, uh, at, Bin at Middlebury, uh, and what I really wanted to show you is all these people that worked on it. So a lot of times it's uh, their leaf strippers or their uh, you know, helping organize the scaffolding or something. But, you know, I've learned to use a lot of people, and uh, we usually have about four or five people at any one time. We've got some people here in the audience who have helped me at other places. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, a piece in, uh, in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, when we were caught by the weather, it just stopped snowing there, and we were building these uh, big pieces called the Garden of Curiosity. Uh, this is a, a normal day at the office for me. People are walking by. This is on the Michigan uh, campus in, in Ann Arbor. Uh, people are walking by. You know, what I always think of a good piece of sculpture is one that causes lots of personal associations so that they're starting points. Uh, people will walk up and tell you about bird nests. They'll tell you about indigenous tribes. They may tell you about an incident under a lilac bush when they were a child, when they first realized that, they, that the, the nature and, and they were different, that the lilac bushes was differentiated from them, or just a walk in the woods, or the first kiss. Uh, but one of my favorites, and it happens almost every time, is a couple will come up, and while the husband is surreptitiously trying to push the sculpture over to see if it's strong enough, the wife will say, honey, we could live here. <laughs> and he'll say, we couldn't live here. And what I've come to realize that means is, you know, that, that there's a desire to give up your worldly possessions cross the forest curtains and just go out there and breathe with all the animals for just a minute. And sometimes we have impromptu openings when this was in New Harmony, Indiana. When we took the scaffold away, the town accumulated, people jumped out of the barber chair, half shaven, and people jumped out of their cars, left the doors open, and ran over and took a good look at this. Uh, in Ireland, people come to see you even if it's completely storming and raining, and Chicago, uh, uh, avid viewer. Uh, well, I wanted to show you that um, sometimes people send me strange pictures of themselves. Uh, these feet come from Houston, and uh, this haircut comes from St. John's in Minnesota. Uh, uh, let's see here. You can understand this. Oh, excuse me. Oh. You can understand this. 
but can you understand this? <laughs> this is in St. Louis at Washington U. I don't know how it happened. If this was in from North Carolina. I don't really, un <laughs> I really don't understand this either. <laughs> so, you know, I wanted to talk about my work in three different ways, finally. I wanted to talk about working with architecture. This was at the decor of, in Lincoln, Mass, with the idea that this tower, this baronial tower is falling back to its origin as a surf's hut. One of the things that you're able to do is contrast contemporary architecture with ancient ways of working. Uh, they weren't keen about me walking on their tile roof up there, so I built a mock-up, picked it up with a crane, and set it on the top of the roof. Uh, the only trouble was that when you looked up at it, it wasn't, the lines were not strong enough, so uh, we got this bucket truck and got up there and, and started working on the surface to enliven it a bit. And what you find is you get up there and you're afraid for a minute, then all of a sudden you ask the operator, would you just mind holding my belt? And you jump outside that cage and start walking around up there on that top of that thing, 70, 70 feet up. Uh, you can see we did enhance the surface and make it you know, more enlivened. Here's a, a Floridian home being attacked by the insect whirl. Uh, you know, the um, uh, cultural center in, in Hollywood, Florida. And I try to maintain, you know, the activity and the walkways and so people can continue to get in and around these pieces. Uh, this is another piece in, uh, in Hollywood, California for Max Azria giving their store a case of the paisley cloth. Uh, I also have worked with trees and used trees as, the, as a matrix on which to work. But this is a, a tree that's 400 years old. A lot of times in Japan, they'll use a rice rope, a kind of small cornucopia around a sacred tree. This tree was planted uh, the day this temple was built, and the temple is sitting in front. I'm looking out at the tree, and so this is kind of the sacred tree and a, and a kind of a welcoming cornucopia. These people came to visit me. You see I built this piece made out of mainly bamboo and reeds into the verge of this hillside there. Uh, this is a, a tree, a Lelandia hedge in, in England, and when you look at that, it seems so solid. But if you step right inside the, the tree line itself, there are these huge cathedral-like spaces. So I was able to enliven those spaces and build this hallway and, and build skylights to look down in those spaces. It's kind of a rabbit warren. You could hear people coming all the way down the hedge to visit you. Um, this is a piece in Birmingham, Alabama, the Birmingham Museum. And, uh, you know, I've learned that if you're going to put something in a tree, you simply have to start it on the ground so that people's eyes will read up. If you get up in the building, you realize that it's 50 feet tall if you're looking at it from above. What I imagined, it was a roller coaster for squirrels. And, that, uh, and it really was so worthy of a hurricane. They had a big hurricane during its, uh, its time that it was up, and the piece stood completely while the uh, other things fell. Um, I've also used the overtones of trees, and so this is an architectural folly down in Savannah. Uh, taking some of the overtones of this uh, uh, big live oak tree. You could see these kind of source limbs above you. It dropped all of this uh, moss down on the piece. It was quite beautiful. A piece in Hawaii at the Contemporary Art Museum and using the, this big monkey pod tree and the uh, trunk set up as a, as a model for these pieces. And uh, they go up and, and kind of work their way through the upper branches and come down and kind of bookend pieces. Uh, this piece in New Harmony, you've got a preview of it before. It turns out that there was a big hollow spot under this hornbeam hedge, and so I was able to work this kind of cliff dwelling into that. It, what you don't see is the main street of this small town runs down at a right angle to it, and so the fenestration of the 1890s and the fenestration of, of this uh, of ancient uh, cliff dwelling are kind of contrasted easily. And then this was uh, its winter configuration where you have a lot of verticality. Uh, a piece in North Carolina at the North Carolina Museum, and each one of these heads is held up by the crown of an independent tree. So there are three cherry trees there, and so I built these pieces, and they're, they're held up by the trees themselves. So sometimes I have to take these pieces down by myself, and there was a big contingent of, of 
kids around the park that come and use this piece every day. I was taking it down. The mothers had an insurrection. They came over there and said, we're going to tell the artist on you. And I said, I am the artist. I'm really sorry. I've got to take this piece down. So some, sometimes it goes to the bad. It's better to take it down in the middle of the night when there's nobody around who can contest it. Sometimes I have to just work in them and, and there's no architecture to work on, there's no trees to work on. They say, this is all we've got. And so this is my earth-saving turtle. It was at uh, a place in France and this was, it belongs to the French government, so this is in it, in the garden of this uh, kind of big castle. Uh, this was in, in Philadelphia at the Morris Arboretum. It started out as a snail shell from my garden and it ended up finally as a layer cake, then a 14th century Japanese hairstyle, and finally uh, back to Dr. Zhivago in the Summer Palace. So, but this came down, and six years later, this last year, I built this other piece exactly on the same spot. This is called Waltz in the Woods, and so sometimes I'm asked back. It's always hard to follow yourself and do something even better than you did the first time. This is a piece um, in North Carolina for a private commission. What I like about this piece is that the interior shows that I'm not using any string, any wire, any nails, no screws. It's just the power that the birds know, the power of infuriating tendency for sticks to tangle that holds this piece together. Uh, sometimes I have to work independent of the architecture, and so this is a piece in Brussels called Sleepwalking. And these pieces are about 27 feet tall, and so oftentimes I have to make them stand up. This is a piece in Purdue, at Purdue, and it was based on uh, this, the uh, serpent mounds in the Ohio Valley. There's a lot of Indian mounds there. They're not really snake-like, but they're very serpentine, so this was my rendition of that. Uh, a piece at Bowdoin College, I've learned to take independent pieces, uh, uh, elements, and stick them together so that they're more uh, weather-worthy. They can hold up against the snow. Uh, a piece that's currently up in, in Rock Hill, South Carolina, uh, in front of a performing arts center called Ain't Misbehavin'. And there are five heads that look down five different streets that come together at this one point. So it's a kind of a nexus in all different ways. A piece at the Museum of Glass in Tacoma, Washington, and using uh, the uh, reflecting pool to extend uh, the kind of feeling of the work. Maybe. This will happen. <laughs> oh, this is a, uh, I'm sorry there. Uh, this is a piece at, at, that's currently up at uh, Peabody Essex in, in Salem, Mass. And just a few weeks ago, maybe a month and a half ago, this is the way it looked, was they had a late storm. Uh, what I really wanted to show you is how many people would come to see a sculpture burned. And, and, and this is all the people in Scotland, right there. So, so they, they came, and this was a Calenish standing stone kind of idea. A beautiful uh, seed uh, gathering situation there with the... Uh, and then uh, my scaffler, he brought the scaffolding over and took it away. You get to see the scale. And uh, of course, this is that fateful night, uh, the morning after. And uh, can you believe that the dancers are cooking their breakfast on my sculpture? <laughs> and uh, a book, which you can figure out how to get if you need it. Uh, thank you very much. If you have questions for Patrick, there are two microphones on the side of the room. So make your way to one of those and we have about 10 minutes for questions. If I don't have any questions, I've done a great job. <laughs> um, thank you for the talk. Oh, is this on? Yeah, speak directly into it. Is it oh, okay, I can hear myself now. Um, I was just thinking, when you take the pieces down, is it sort of like an emotional, like, I'm killing my baby, you know, sort of thing? Or has it, have you just gotten used to that? Is that? Or is that part of the sort of art of it? Uh, it could be like pulling a bad tooth, but uh, <laughs> I, I uh, you know, I've, I think my uh, 
the value of the pieces for me are, is in the building, you know, and uh, then I turn them over to the public and they have to use them and keep them. But at, uh, sadly enough, at a two year or three year mark, the pieces look a little less. I always say that the line between trash and treasure is very thin with sticks. So, you know, you can script an illusion that really works and then down the road, particularly if they're in out exterior settings, uh, they become less and less. So, you know, usually they are taken down while they still look good. Of course, it's a little bit of sadness for me, but uh, usually as opposed to some uh, artists that have a show and don't really get that much viewing, these pieces get an enormous amount of viewing. They get the viewing during the three weeks of the building process. I was joking today with somebody that at the end uh, of your time there, somebody's always pulling on your sleeve and saying, didn't we do a good job? You know, it looked better yesterday. Don't ruin it. So there's, there's a constant interplay between the public layer, there. And then, you know, people use these things intensely while they're up. So it's a little bit less sad than it, than it could be. Can you talk a little more specifically about the piece downstairs and sort of how you built it, how you decided what to build, how long it took, things like that? Yeah, all my work takes three weeks. And, uh, you know, I was thinking really about when I saw the space, I loved it. I thought it's such an enormously beautiful space. What I need to do is make it look like nature is taking the building back. So there's a lot of scampering around by the sticks as they're flying up against the wall, a lot of animation. Um, we had to, because we had to process the sticks so thoroughly, uh, we got a willow farm in upstate New York to put them in a freezer uh, for two weeks at 20 below to kill any potential powder post beetles. We had fire retard, we had to do a lot of re leaf removal. So we had the sticks arrived and to the amazement of the staff, five hours of hauling the sticks into the building off of a huge tractor trailer truck. We didn't need all the sticks, we just needed a lot of choices. So we stacked them in the gallery and we constantly moved them around as the piece emerged. So we did have a dumpster full of sticks at the end. We sent some out to Reston, Virginia, where we had another piece, and we went out there and remodeled that work with this material we had here. You know, I was really pleased with the way the, the work uh, turned out. We have pictures from Friday where uh, Michelle Obama and the Nordic Council, of the, uh, the wives of the Nordic Council, came over and looked at it. And uh, I've, uh, Facebook has been replete with tons of pictures of just lots of people being in there, having their picture taken. So it's just been a joy for me to see what has gone on with this piece and how popular it has been. The first time I stumbled upon your work was at Dumbarton Oaks, and I wasn't expecting to see it. And it was standing in the middle of the topiary trees. And at first I thought it was actually natural growth of some kind that they shaped. Um, anyway, that, that was a stunning um, display. Did you uh, have the uh, lay of the grounds and determine where you wanted to build, or how, how was that determined? Well, um, as in, in, in this case here, just to speak of, you know, we went around a lot of the galleries and they were willing to offer me this huge gallery below, and so I said, I can take it. I, I'm sure I can make something that will you know, you know, make a great piece there. The one at Dunbarton Oaks, which maybe some of you saw, uh, was in there. They've got a big oval shape with these trees that surround it. And um, we made these pieces that looked like they were going up and flowing up onto the edge of this inner circle and, and speeding the trees up. So a lot of times they'll say, take a walk around and look. And if I find some place that I think might make a really great piece, I say, how about if I could use this so I was given that space. I was just so happy with it. But it also requires huge amounts of sticks because you have to, uh, you know, to really work in a big open public space. A lot of times you have to scale the piece to fit the space, even if you have to suffer a bit. Yeah. Uh, do you ever have like a just catastrophic failure? Like your tree falls down or you just have to scrap it and start over? Do you mean would I ever admit that I had a failure? <laughs> Not really. I think what I do is overbuild. You know, I constantly overbuild, and I've learned over time, you know, how to make things stand up, and um, I'm constantly leaning things on other things, 
sometimes they, you know, they have to endure pretty severe weather. This piece at St. John's was a series of, I didn't show it to you, but there are five little chapels, I mean giant chapels that lean together called the Monk's Cradle. And uh, so uh, that endured, you know, 60 below and had and stayed up for three years and still stood. So that was based on leaning these elements of these little chapels together. So, you know, it's, it's just a knack uh, for trying to figure out how to make things stand up, uh, using railings, using anything that I can grab hold on onto to make them stand. Sticks are pretty strong, and when you use them, and uh, like almost like making felt, you know, you're, you get your basic sticks up and then start jamming lots of sticks and diagonals between. It makes an incredibly strong piece. Well, listen, thank you all very much for having me. Thanks everyone for coming. A quick note about exiting. Because our front door is still closed due to the activity down 17th, we can only exit through the elevator. However, if you would like to use stairs, we do have basement stairs that our staff access. And so our volunteer, Linda, the lovely lady in the brown jacket and glasses, will help direct you down our main staircase and around back. You head like actually like you're going toward Patrick's gallery, but then you take a quick sharp right or left toward the center and there's a double doors down there and we'll have another staff person to direct you down so we're not all waiting for the elevator you're welcome to wait